Welcome back to my channel. I'm Brian Kafke. In this video, which is the continuation of the Master Databricks series, this is the second video in which we're going to be talking about how to create the Databricks workspace. Now, this is a second edition of my Master Databricks and Apache Spark series, which is going to bring it really completely up to date and focus only on Databricks. So let's jump in. But we'll start by what is a Databricks workspace anyway? What the heck are you talking about, Brian? A Databricks workspace is sort of your entry point, right? You're going to Azure. Azure doesn't know you want to use Databricks. When you say, I want to use Databricks, it needs to create that environment for you, including all the compute resources. So you essentially have your own world for Databricks, your own Databricks environment. And they call that Databricks environment a workspace. Things that it includes are file storage. And this is DBFS, which is Databricks File System, local file storage, which is actually an Azure blob if you're using Azure, which is what I'm going to focus on here. But it could also be in AWS or Google Cloud. It also needs a virtual machine to run the Databricks user interface so that you can interact with it and a bunch of other things also. And when you run clusters, of course, it's going to have to be able to create the clusters under the covers. It also needs to run all that Databricks software. You know, it's got to run Spark and all the good things there, and it's going to do that within the workspace. And it has to include all the network stuff and things it needs to have so that it can connect to resources within your cloud environment. Now, when you go in to create a workspace, you're going to get a choice. And this is probably the single biggest choice, although it's kind of a non-issue now, which is whether you're going to take the standard edition or the premium tier. Well, the standard is actually being deprecated here. Now, I could not find good information on this, so I just asked Google and the AI kicked in. And you can see here that it's saying that standard is being deprecated. It's already been deprecated on AWS and Google, and it looks like Azure is soon to follow. So just bear that in mind. It doesn't make sense to use the standard tier anymore. And you probably don't want to anyway because the standard tier does not include Unity Catalog and a bunch of other newer features. This kind of tells you here why deprecation. Basically, Databricks doesn't want to sort of support this low end. And it, let's face it, it probably costs more for the premium, so they want to charge you more. But either way, you're going to need it. Now, before I jump into creating a workspace, and you haven't seen it yet, I know you want to see it. It's exciting. But I do want to talk a little bit about a problem that Databricks workspaces have had since the earliest days when they were released. And that is each workspace, as I mentioned, is its own little world. You can almost think of it as its own little machine, and it doesn't know anything about other machines. It's self-contained, which is good in some ways, but it leads to a bit of an issue. So let me kind of walk through this. You're going into a company, as I do, with a consultant, and I've done this, actually, so I'll tell you how it works. And you create or have a workspace created, because usually a data engineer won't be creating their own workspaces. There's probably some infrastructure people there to create things for them. But they'll create a workspace. In this case, it's for finance. They want to create a nice big data warehouse on, say, Delta Lake, and they're going to start with the dev environment, right? So they can play around and develop, and that's going to be a less secure, less rigid environment and probably doesn't have, hopefully, a copy of the production data. Then you'll have a QA environment or something that's sometimes called an integration testing environment where you take the pieces of code you're building in dev, really put them through their testing, make sure they're approved for release to production, and hence you also have to have your production environment. Now this is a typical thing in almost any large corporation. Sometimes you also have like pre-prod environments and other ones, but almost always you'll have at least these three. Now that's okay, and because you want to share the resources and the collaboration is going to happen just within the finance team in this case. You want to keep it self-contained anyway. Say, okay, this is great. But then you have an application comes along, sales. You say, okay, we're going to do the same thing for now. Sales, dev, QA, prod. Well, now you think about it, you're like, okay, we've already got three workspaces and we could have HR, we could have some sort of production facilities and on and on of all the different departments you can imagine in a large company. That could be easily like 50 departments or more. So you would have 150 workspaces in that scenario, we've got 50 times three. So what's the problem? Well, this workspace proliferation creates a huge maintenance issue because these all have to be maintained. They have upgrades and changes to the Databricks runtimes that need to change. They have security maintenance. Basically, each one is its own world, and that means somebody's going to have to keep track of them, know where they all are. They have to maintain all this, and this is a bit of an issue because if you've worked in the cloud, you know it's already hard enough to follow all the things being created. It is not the situation where you have sort of one Databricks workspace umbrella, and then you can just create different applications under it. No, each one is really separate, and there is no really one umbrella to kind of wrap it all up, which is a bit of an issue. Now, to emphasize this a little more, think about what each one has separate. 
it has separate storage has separate hive catalog i'll come back to that but a hive catalog this originated from spark where they leveraged hadoop's file system and then decided also to use what they call the hive catalog what hive does is it stores the metadata for table like information right so like the name of the table the column types things like that so that when you want to query it it knows where to look to get the information about how the data is stored so the hive catalog is local to a single workspace and cannot be seen outside of that workspace secret scopes now this is specific to azure but I'm sure that the other cloud environments have something similar. When you want to reach out and connect, for instance, using something like Key Vault, then you use a secret scope, grab the key, and then be able to access resources you need in that environment. And again, it is specific to a workspace. You also have your notebooks and your code. And if they're integrated with GitHub, you're probably okay, but it generally is also going to be having a copy of those programs in the workspace itself, probably stored on local storage, which we just mentioned. So this can also be kind of an issue because it's all separate. Also, your workspaces are configured separately. So I want to emphasize this a bit because it does become a hindrance to large scale development. Now, one thing that Databricks did do to kind of improve the situation is they created Unity Catalog. The high catalog, which stores the metadata, is restricted to being only in a single workspace and they cannot see other workspaces. Unity Catalog is one piece of the workspace that Databricks took out and put it completely separate. And this is for data governance and, and security and administration. So Unity Catalog is really a replacement for the Hive Catalog to address this problem of not being able to sort of see across your workspaces. It's still a problem in many parts of it, as you can see, but at least now your data can have a centralized catalog that is at the enterprise level. And it's very similar if you think of something like Azure Purview, which is designed to do the same thing, except Purview was meant to do that for any type of data anywhere in Azure, whereas the Hive catalog is really specific to what you're working on in Databricks. Finally, if you say, Brian, I don't want to have to pay for Databricks. I'm only a student. I got no money. What am I going to do? Well, what you can do still, and surprisingly, it's still available, though I will say Databricks is doing their darndest to hide this feature to people, is if you go to databricks.com slash try Databricks, you can see down here, right? Then you'll get to this page. Now, this is just the right hand half of the page because I wanted to be able to focus on this. There's a lot of junk saying Databricks, Yahoo, and the other side, but this is the main part. Now, when you look at this, it says continue with Express Setup, continue with Cloud Setup. What they don't emphasize is this really important little micro dot link here, which says click here. Looking for Databricks Community Edition? Why, yes, yes, I am. Well, that is a free version of Databricks. You can use it. It's in the cloud. It, I believe it runs actually on AWS behind the scenes. And the beauty of it is you can just use it. It's free. There are a lot of limitations, but free is good. So that's a good deal. You can follow that. Now, once you've gone in and created your free community edition, and by the way, it also allows you to use pretty much any email. It's not restricted the way the other versions are to having like a company type of email or like a Microsoft one. To get back into it, though, you may get a little lost. You can go back into it and log in and play around again by going to community.cloud.databricks.com. So I'll put these slides out on GitHub, so you'll be able to get them. I'll put a link in the description. But really important, if you want free Databricks, you can do it. But I will say, every time I come back to this, after a while, they move it around. They keep trying to make it less and less obvious to people they can get a free version because they want you to do the 14-day trial so they can force you into buying something right away, even if you're just a student. So what are we losing if we use the free version? Well, you can see here, and I, I honestly couldn't find good information. They used to have a nice page that just quickly summarized what you got with the Community Edition. So assuming Google AI is right, because I just asked it and it gave me this answer, you can see that it has limits about how long a cluster can be running. So it terminates after two hours. You can't restart a cluster, but you can create another one. It has limitations on data retention. There's a lot of things. It's limited memory, limited space. I believe you can used to be able to upload at least six gig, but there's a lot of things going on. You can't do integration with Git and all these different things here you can see. But honestly, if you're just trying to learn Databricks and you want to learn how to use PySpark and SQL and all those things that go a part of it, you'll be good. You'll have 90% of what you need here. When you want to use more advanced features like Unity Catalog, connecting out to cloud environments like Key Vault or things like that, you're going to not be able to do that. So that's a given. And some of the ML stuff is probably also very limited here. All right, so as I promised, let's go in and see how we can create our very own Databricks workspace in Azure. This is not doing the free version. This is assuming we're just going to pay for it. As I mentioned, you can do the 14-day trial through Azure, but I've had issues with that, and I found that it would just not allow you to create a cluster very easily because it gives you very constrained compute. And while you can go around it and try to push that up, you'd probably be better off if you really want it free, just use the Community Edition or 
create one in the portal. I have found so far that having a actual Databricks workspace on Azure is not very costly as long as I make sure my clusters are turned off. That's really where the money is, okay? So to start, let's go to portal.azure.com. And here we are, we've logged into Azure. This is their portal. And the easiest way to create something is to click on this create a resource, the little plus sign, and then just search for what you want to create, say Databricks. So we'll take the first thing, Databricks. And you can see here, Azure Databricks right here. We're going to say create, create Azure Databricks. So this is, when they say create Azure Databricks, they mean you're going to create a workspace. So if you're thinking, would I have to do this if I had 300 of these all separate? Yeah, you would actually. You could do it through code or something, but you still have to create it. So we're going to first pick our subscription. I'm going to use pay as you go. And resource groups are really important. Now, when you create a workspace, you're creating a lot of resources, VMs, network cards, and all kinds of things. And you want to make sure that it's all in a container that you can easily get rid of. So my recommendation is to create a new resource group for this. Do not just dump it in with other things because then you'll have no way to get rid of it unless you dump everything else with it because you won't know what all these little pieces are and you might end up with orphaned resources. So I like to start with RG and I'll say, just to make this easy, I'll say B, PC, Databricks, WS. All right, that's what I'm going to use. Say OK. And now what I like to do to keep this consistent is I'll get rid of the RG and just say BPC Databricks WS. And what I was just going to do is make sure this workspace name is unique within, I believe, the region. So you has to be unique and you may have to put some weird numbers on it to make it that way if you have something very generic in names then you pick your region now the region you pick should be something that is close to you why do i need it to be close to me because the communication that's going on should stay within the same region i'm living in the boston area so east us 2 is the closest to me or east us if you were on say the west coast you'd be using like west us but you want to make sure whatever you're picking is the closest you can get for you and all the resources you're connecting to and using within Databricks should also be in the same region. So let's look again at the pricing tier. You've got premium, standard, and then you see trial. As I mentioned, trial has a lot of limitations, but if you want to, you could try it. At least then you'll be restricted to not paying for it. It should stop working after 14 days or force you to enter a credit card or something. Standard is there, but again, I think it's going away soon. So in most real use cases, you're going to go to premium. You can have this manage resource group name. We're not going to use that feature right now. So let's go to next networking. And we have these things. We can say deploy Azure Databricks workspace with a secure cluster, no public IP. The idea is that you're trying to make sure nobody can just reach out and connect to this. So by not providing a public IP address, you're really going a long way towards securing this. In this case, I'm not going to do that. You can also say deploy Azure Databricks workspace in your own virtual network. Again, same type of thing. It's hiding it behind things and then within the VNet you can connect resources. Okay, so we're gonna go next, encryption. Now I'm not gonna pick any of these things, but I can use uh, managed disks and managed services which encrypt over and above what Databricks would normally do and Azure would normally do. I can also use double encryption for DBFS, right? The Databricks file system root. I can do all those things and that may make sense depending on your organization. We can add more things, enable compliant security profile and security monitor and cluster update. I haven't used these before. I don't think you need to worry about them. Most of the time, anything like this is probably going to be a security and compliance group within an organization. As a data engineer, I'd be a little concerned if they let me decide these things. Not that I wouldn't have my say about it or recommendations, but generally this is something that has to be handled at the at the corporate security level. So we can say next tags. Tags are just things you can sort of put on it like little labels with values so that if you want to find it later, like this is prod or it's something else, you can do that. We don't really need to do that. And so now we'll go to review and create. And review and create lets us see you know what we have going on, what we've chosen, and uh, and then we can just click create. You can see here saying going for deployment says deployment in progress and the bell at the top is when it's running to do something it'll give you notifications so you can watch that until this workspace is available while that's creating I'm not even going to bog down too much in here we'll come back to this later but I'm going to finish my presentation and I'm not going to really do anything in Databricks at this point itself just know that when you're done I'll go to one that I've already created here and I can just bring up the workspace and say launch the workspace and you can see here now I'm in the workspace all the assets and things that I would want to hear uh, I can create what I want but I can you can see here I've got the workspace I showed this in my previous video the catalog all these things available to me so this is where you would do all of your development work okay so to review where we've been this is a very short video because the workspace is really very easy to create and you go right into the workspace after creating and you can just use it 
So we talked about also, if you don't want to do that and you don't want to pay anything, you can use the free community edition. We talked about creating workspace. I walked you through doing that in the Azure portal. You would do something similar in GCP or AWS. And then we talked about launching the workspace very, very briefly. After you create the workspace, all you have to do is find it in the portal, click on it to open it up. And then right in the first blade, you just click on it to start the workspace and you're good to go and just start working. That's all for this time. Thank you. Please like, share, subscribe. And until next time, I'm pulling for you. We're all in this together. Thank you.